Sense Consciousness by Jerome A. Anderson, read by Dave Marsland of Cardiff Theosophical Society. Sense Consciousness An important faculty of the soul, or mode of consciousness, is that of sense perception. Man's body is composed of numerous organs, some sensory, some for locomotion, some for thought, others for desire, and still others for vital or purely assimilative purposes, and all intended to enable him to contact this plane of being, maintain his foothold here, and to assimilate the wisdom accruing out of his manifold experiences. The sensory organs are so constructed as to intercept and enable him to take conscious note of vibrations covering a vast but very incomplete arc of the infinite cycle of life. From smell or touch up to the almost infinitely rapid vibrations of colour, his differing organs record the impressions or sensations produced by vibrations reaching him from without. There is, however, such a great hiatus between the higher and the lower of these as to more than suggest the possibility of his evolving other sense organs to enable him to contact still wider areas of sensuous existence hereafter. Putting this aside for the present, we find the range of his sense consciousness to be so great and its reception of the impressions by constant contact with material things so multitudinous that he has all his attention fully occupied if he segregates, analyzes and gathers the ethical meaning of the phenomena with which they bring him into relation. So here we see the necessity of thought as the dominant faculty during the embodiment upon earth. Like other animals, man's response to sense impressions must always have been, and still is, largely mechanical. But as evolutionary ages rolled by, there was accomplished the conscious segregation or differentiation of these stimuli into great classes and the consequent specialization of organs, therefore, and so gradually and imperceptibly was built up man's present sense organs. Just how these sense impressions reach the soul, the transient tenant of the body, is not within the province of our present inquiry. Suffice it to say that the unity of source of all consciousness constitutes a common bond between the most highly developed and the most lowly, which enables each to touch a base where consciousness is common to both, so that the soul can be, and is, conscious of the lowly vibrations of its sensuous body because of their being from their common origin something in its high development which recognizes this for it is a portion of the consciousness of the lower were it not for this common basis in which all forms and differentiations of consciousness must root entities at different stages of their evolution would be absolutely cut off from all consciousness of other portions of the universe. Indeed, man is now conscious of but that small portion which he has actually experienced, and by experience evolved the latent potentiality of so doing into an active potency. For no manifesting entity possesses any state of consciousness which it has not evolved by actual experience in the cycle of necessity or arena of evolution. Man knows and recognizes his material universe because, and only because, he has been that universe in all its myriad details. He has buried himself in its rocks, pulsated with and in its rhythmic oceans, felt the peace and strength of its mighty oaks, or he could not now be conscious that such things exist. While thought takes cognizance of these sense impressions, it is not necessary to their existence, nor even to their recognition. The pure ecstasy rising out of the highest self-consciousness excludes thought entirely. Indeed, thought would only mar its perfectness. Who that has ever had his soul enwrapped in the tones of a perfect harmony thought about or tried to analyse what was taking place? While it lasted, time was not. Thought had ceased its querulous interrogations, and the soul was content. 
It had no questionings, no doubts. It did not even exist. It was. Similarly, beautiful landscapes, the low, ceaseless murmur of the restless waves breaking upon the shore, the roar of the storm, the stillness after it has passed, all these things reach not the soul through the avenue of thought. They may evoke thought, but they are really a memory, a reminiscence of the soul, and penetrate it by means of the avenue of feeling. And, if perfect, they do not even evoke thought. Man does not have to reason with himself to know that he is happy. He does not even think of it until after the wave of perfect bliss has passed. The vibrations of seeing, hearing, tasting and so on roll in upon the soul and man becomes conscious of them entirely independent of any thinking process. He usually does connect them with thought, but the connection is not essential to their existence or recognition. It is largely due to the association of ideas. At the awakening of sensuous life in man at each birth, his world is new and wonderful, and he is little else than an animated interrogation point, as all who have the care of children will recognise. The habit so engendered becomes despotic in its sway, and indeed, nature intended this, so that automatically, and by the association of ideas, his questioning analysis goes on long after perfect familiarity with any phenomenon has rendered this unnecessary. But the crowning proof that sense consciousness is distinct from and not dependent upon thought is to be found in the animal kingdom. Here it is seen in all its purity and perfectness, although here it is already at work upon its Herculean task of evoking the latent power of thinking in a soul which is revelling only in the senses. The higher animals unquestionably think, but the starfish as unquestionably does not. Its slow, laborious response to sense stimuli has not yet reached this plane of consciousness. But natura non saltet, and we must not confound sense consciousness with thought consciousness because the two glide imperceptibly into each other and they are but two differentiations of the one great primal consciousness just as the senses themselves are but lower differentiations of the one sense consciousness sense consciousness is thus seen to be the servant who prepares the way for thought the pioneer who blazes out the pathways by which thought may guide its following footsteps by its aid, life becomes a long panorama of nature sights and sounds, every one of which thought must analyse and understand. We may sit idly and drink in the sense impressions, but in doing so, we are only laggards on the way. We should understand the meaning, from its ethical aspect, of every one of these. It is not enough to classify a name to seek for external differences and similarities. The inner meaning of it all must be sought out. Knowledge which does not broaden the human character and make it more humane or godlike is no knowledge. Its acquirement is time thrown away. But nature is infinitely patient, and although we must get our lesson before this earth grows old and dies to give place to newer and, let us hope, more perfect ones, still the interval is so long that there is ample opportunity and none need fail because of lack of this. Sense consciousness is probably one of the lowest and most humble of all divine differentiations within the sea of conscious life, for it is certainly one of the most transient. Yet, nevertheless, it is an absolutely necessary accessory to other and higher states, so that it will not do just to pass it by too quickly. Let us rather learn its lessons, assist it to perform its duties, lean not upon its transient pleasures or the glimpses of life which it affords, but use it as a door through which we may enter the real college of life, as a preparatory department in the university of being.